exploring the bizarre. bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, 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 ghosts, ghosts lost, worlds, lost worlds, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Back. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bizarre, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Oh, how much is that doggy in the window? The one with the waggly tail. How much is that doggy in the window? I do hope that doggy's for sale. Oh, oh. I don't want a bunny or a kitty. I don't want a parrot that talks. I don't want a bowl of little fish cheese. He can't take a goldfish for a walk. <laughs> oh, what's gotten into you this evening? Uh, I didn't know that you were such a pet lover. Well, see, there's a Tim. There's a lot you don't know about me. I want to reincarnate as a dog, mm. so people will pet me, <laughs> and uh, I can do other th- things to other people that I don't particularly uh, like. I can pretend <laughs> they're a fire hydrant, and, and and just think I wouldn't have to work. I could just sit around all day and sleep and i certainly would win best in show (laughs) oh wow speaking of shows this is a perfect open for uh tonight's uh really uh uh, a tail wagon program (laughs) why do you say that tim (laughs) well tim We've got uh, uh, two fantastic guests, and we are going to talking about, um, well, psychic communication uh, with uh, with animals and pets, uh, not only uh, uh, living, but those who are passed on. As uh, well, I, I imagine that uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, communication with uh, humans that have uh, uh, passed on as, as well. But uh, I think that uh, everyone's interested in uh, wanting to know what uh, you know your little fur babies are uh, are thinking, or or maybe with some people they they don't want to know what their fur babies are uh, are thinking about them. Well, you know, I I did have one uh, psychic experience with a pet. Uh, we always had cats uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, alley cats, Persian cats. Um, since I was aller- allergic to the hair after a while, mm. uh, anyway, we had one great cat, uh, whose name was, uh, Nikki and, uh, the cat, you know, cats don't, um, uh, live, uh, forever. And, um, anyway, Nikki uh, passed uh, away. Yeah. I must've been pretty young, maybe eight or nine years old. Uh, anyway, one day I was upstairs in the apartment above, uh, uh where I live with my parents, uh, my grandmother uh, and grandfather lived upstairs. And, and I hear the, um, uh, like uh, a ball rolling on the floor mm. and, 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 and there's this, uh, the cat, except the cat was, um, uh, deceased. I, I mean, it, it had passed away a couple of years before and he chased the ball down the hall and went through the wall. Mm. So, wow. uh, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's uh, just another one of those, uh, uh, odd occurrences that have kind of dotted my, um, uh, my, uh, my life, you know? Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh cats are just, uh, uh, wonderful. I don't know, however, is if I necessarily believe that we can uh, talk to them and, and, and maybe we can. And, and, uh, I'm interested in knowing if I can reincarnate as a dog or am I just going backwards? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I think that maybe, you know, they, uh, people say that, you know, like a dog or a cat could uh, reincarnate as a person, but I think for them, that would be going backwards. Now you're right. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> right on that. So, uh, I, and I, well, I wonder, I, I wonder if, 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 if animals can, uh, well, I, I guess some animals do take on kind of the, the likeness and the behavior of their, uh, their owners. And, and I wonder if an animal can be possessed by a human. Hmm. Strange, Ooh. but 
yeah, there you go. You got you got questions to uh, to uh, to ask, and uh, I, I'm never thought to never, find I, out. So. I, I never thought about that that one before. Well, there you go. Well, uh, you know, hey, there's all kinds of things that that just spiral around in my mind. <laughs> and, and, and so, why don't you introduce our, our you know, to, to tell the audience about what we're going to be discussing tonight, and give a little bit more detail. Sure. Well, uh, our guest tonight, and uh, and and I'm just uh, so grateful that we were able to uh, uh, line them up. We have uh, Karen Anderson and uh, June Lundgren. Now, uh, Karen uh, Karen Anderson is a number one best selling and international award winning author, uh, an award winning animal communicator and psychic medium, and has been professionally communicating with pets and. De- departed human spirits for over 20 years her amazingly accurate psychic abilities earned the prestigious first place award for the 2013 reader's choice choice award for best animal communicator and the second place award uh, the prior year now karen discovered her special gift as a child and her abilities developed over the years and became uh, particularly significant when she was a deputy sheriff Uh, It was during a police investigation that she realized that animals could provide accurate and detailed information on crime scenes. I guess that's where the uh, term stool pigeon came from. Combining her law enforcement background with her psychic abilities, Karen now works closely with law enforcement agencies to solve cold cases and missing person cases, bringing closure to victims and their families. Now, Karen has written two books the best-selling and international award-winning The Amazing Afterlife of Animals and the best-selling book Hear All Creatures. So uh, she's also uh, collaborated with, um, uh, 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 let's see, uh, what is this, leading psychologist Dr. Patricia uh, Carrington for her book The Secret Inner Life of Pets and is a co-author for Amazing Paranormal Encounters of Volume 2. With us as well tonight is June Lundgren. Now, June is a psychic medium, animal communicator, healer, professional nurse, demon seer, and international author. She comes from a long line of psychic women. Mentored by her maternal grandmother, June learned at an early age how to use her gifts of mediumship, ability to see negative entities, and to look into the future to help Others. As a psychic medium, June communicates with those who have died and angels to find answers and peace of mind for the living. She has talked to animals since she was a child. In 2009, she wrote her first public book, published book to let people know that God does hear our prayers, uh, but that uh, what they want is not necessarily what we need. The result was her first book, A Medium Which Guide to the Paranormal. Since then, she's written uh, three other paranormal-based books, Paranormal Encounters, book one and two, The Dark Side of the Paranormal, uh, a paranormal romance called Out of Time, and then two children's books, Petals, Golden Wings, and Susie's Big Adventure. She has a new fantasy series entitled Demon Seekers, The Journey Begins. I like the title of that one. I want to read that one. Uh, June is also the co-founder of Ghost and Girls Paranormal, as well as a member of the uh, Northwest Paranormal Investigative Team. So, uh, June, Karen, thank you very much for being with us tonight on Exploring the Bazaar. Thank you for having me. Wow, thanks. That was a great intro. It was kind of long, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we want our listeners to uh, uh, to know what they're getting into <laughs> uh, uh, before before the show actually starts. So uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, with Karen here now. Um, Karen, I, I uh, you know, understand that, uh, and like June, that. Uh, you uh, you realize at a pretty young age that um, that that animals aren't just dumb creatures, you know, with no you know, no no thinking ability or just you know, relying uh, solely on instinct. That there's uh, a little more going on in their little uh, furry heads. Oh yeah! In fact, the earliest memories I have, my closest friends were animals when I was a little kid. In fact, I could understand them. And thought everyone could. I didn't know that it was doing. I was doing something different or unique. I just thought everyone could hear their thoughts like I did. So yeah, it goes way back. That my <laughs> earliest memories are my childhood pets and 
being able to understand them, certainly not on the level that I do now, but as a small child, I would know things about them that I shouldn't have known. Now, did uh, uh, and I asked this of, of, of a lot of people who who are on our show. Uh, was there anybody else in your family that uh, that that had uh, psychic abilities? I mean, a mother, grandparents, somebody like that. Uh, they do, but they're afraid of it, so <laughs> they didn't <laughs> sharpen their skills. They uh, they are still. My mom doesn't quite know what to do with it sometimes, even though she's very intuitive herself and even my grandmother, but nobody really uses their abilities the way that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I found the part of uh, 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 the book, um, uh, was it The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, where you were talking about how uh, you first got into uh, a law enforcement and, uh, uh, and, and how... You were assisted, actually, uh, by by animals on uh, uh, several cases. Do you want to uh, uh, tell us about that? Well, and, okay, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, it 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 started. I think you were saying that that, that you had a cat that had a, a urinary tract uh, a problem that uh, told you about it. Well, that was where everything started to snowball. Is when I was a police officer because I worked in a mountain district. And uh, uh, right out of the academy, they put me on the night shift, and I also worked alone, or the nearest backup car was sometimes a half an hour or more away. So I was responding to all these different calls for help uh, by myself. So uh, it was during that time that I started to pay attention to that little voice in the back of my head, and my psychic ability started to get heightened and sharpened because just for my own personal safety. And so during that time as a police officer, that's when everything started to kick in again. And, uh, and yes, it was one of my own cats that I got the first message from where I heard it very clearly in my head. And uh, it was an urgent message because he was having a medical emergency. I thought I was literally crazy. I thought I was hearing things, thought I was hearing voices, looking around the room to see who said it, but it was in my own voice, in my own head. So that was kind of a weird experience. And then what happened after that is once I realized what was going on, I realized that animals on crime scenes could give me information. And um, and they often could tell me what happened even before I got on scene or who a perpetrator was. So, yeah, they became a wealth of information. I can think of uh, uh, so many cases <laughs> that that could probably be solved if, if uh, more people had that ability to listen to what animals uh, uh, say when there's no, you know, human survivors or, or witnesses. Um, uh, now, uh, you know, when you, in, in some of these cases uh, that, that, that you were investigating, uh, you know, you say that you heard the animal's voices in your head. And I've talked to other uh, animal psychics, and a lot of times they'll say that, that animals tend not to uh, communicate in words, but they tend to be more visually oriented. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, your impressions almost is that, you know, you're hearing words in your own voice. Well, it, it just depends on the individual. It also depends on the animal. I happen to have a very, a very good psychic ear, which is an inner ear, and so I'm clairaudient. So I will hear voices. It's actually my voice. It's usually my voice. Um, but, yes, the animals can also send images. They can send you a feeling or an emotion. Um, some of them are, are really good at sending all of those, and some of them are only good at sending um, messages one way, one particular way. It just depends. They're all different. Just like you know, humans are all different. They all have different abilities. Well, I, I, I've got to uh, ask uh, here. H- have you ever tried to bring this up in an actual uh, court case? <laughs> of course not. You know, I well, kept it to uh, myself. When I was on the department, yeah. I would have been the laughing stock of of the sheriff's department. So, no, I mean, that's not going to hold up in court. Yeah. But I'll tell you well, what. I, I, um, that's, that's what that's what I that's what I, I would uh, I would uh, think. Is there any way of getting around it, though? I mean, can you bring out the inform? Well, you would have to verify the information in some other way. 
Right, right. And and no, nothing was ever brought up in court. I mean, that was that's you know something for the, maybe for the movies, but not in real life. But no, they were able to give me information who the perpetrator was on a domestic violence case. Uh, a resident pet could tell me who the aggressor was. Uh, before I even arrived on scene, they were witness to what happened, and they could tell me what happened. They could show me what happened. I had a resident cat uh, at a crime scene of a case of domestic violence tell me where the perpetrator was hiding. He had fled on foot. And I was out taking a statement from the victim, and her cat came out of the house and went right over to a shed, looked right at me, and said, inside. Now, this was a shed that had already been searched, and somehow he snuck in there when nobody was paying attention or nobody saw him. So he was hiding right there, right where we were standing, and the cat told me that he was inside the shed. So, you know, there's information that they can share in, in the way that they're capable of sending information, and some of that is limiting. I've had pets tell me where uh, a lost boy was in the National Forest, told me which direction he went, and um, those types of things happen. And, and that's what I was able to... Uh, it blew my mind when it first started happening. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy, but why not? I just never told anyone that my confidential informants had four legs and a tail. <laughs> Now, uh, can you tell, okay, obviously all, all animals uh, cannot uh, do this, but uh, you work mainly with the dogs and cats or uh, other animals as well? Well, I'm primarily, I work with people's pets. So cats, dogs, uh -huh. horses, there's a few birds mixed in there, but I can communicate with all animals as, you know, June will uh, be able to chime in on me with me there too that any animal can communicate with us in various different ways it doesn't have to be a pet you can also communicate with wild animals but the majority of my work is geared around people's pets mm. and uh, is there uh, any type of animal would you say that's more intelligent than the other in other words are you more likely to get the uh, uh, information that can be validated out of a horse as opposed to a uh, a cat or a dog or well i'll i'll explain it this way within every species so within the dog group the cat group horses whales dolphins everything across the board within that group just like with humans you're going to have some that are super intelligent and very communicative you're going to have some that aren't and the majority of them fall right in the in the middle uh -huh. can can you t uh, take a, a, or think of one specific uh, case of what? Uh, of of uh, an animal communicating with you or something, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, panned out later on. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have a lot of those that panned yeah. out. Uh, one that yeah. jumps into my head, uh, that's really incredible, is I had a, um, a cold case that I was working on, and there were two cats that were in the apartment when the victim was abducted and he had been missing for approximately three years and of course he was assumed dead but there was no body so there were no leads there were no suspects and the case had gone cold and the, my client contacted me to see if the cats could share any information after she heard about my work and what I did and the cats actually one of the cats gave me the initials which I didn't know ahead of time the initials of the prime suspect now, the problem there was they didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest, but without knowing anything about the case, I was able to give my client confirmation of what they suspected as to who actually killed her brother. And mm. that, to me, is amazing. So when I work with law enforcement, you know, they... Any information is good information, and, and if it helps to close a case, if it helps bring closure to the victims and their families, you know, most people are open to that. Do they all want to work with psychics? No, but a lot of law enforcement agencies are now working with psychics. I tend to have more credibility because I'm an ex-cop. So mm -hmm. they know that when they're talking to me, they're not talking to you know, just the average psychic, that I actually have law enforcement background, and so... 
uh, that carries some credibility. So when I do work with law enforcement agencies, that truly helps. And, um, and they're truly, it, the tide is turning. More and more agencies are open to working with psychics because why not? Would you rather have no information about a case or would you rather have some information and possibly really good information? Hmm. Well, how do how do um, uh, people uh, approach you? I mean, how do they uh, hear uh, that your services are available? I mean, is it kind of like word of mouth, or? Well, most of my work now is generated from people have read my book, uh, my books, um, mm-hmm. the Amazing Afterlife of Animals and Hero Creatures. So that's where the majority of my clients find me is through that work. But, you know, I've been around for a long time. I've been doing this now for over 20 years, so I've established quite a reputation for myself, and I get a lot of referral business, too. So I'd say it's probably about half and half right now, half referral business and half through my my books. So now when it, uh, um, you talked about the uh, uh, cooperation that you do at times with uh, uh, various police agencies, uh, I know that, uh, you know, from my own experience that uh, uh, a lot of cops, I mean, they, they tend to at least publicly look down their nose at, at psychics, uh, yet a lot of them admit that they have their own abilities, you know, like uh, what they call the blue sense. Uh, and uh, then, you know, if they can't uh, work it out, they'll, they'll bring in a psychic, but they'll, they'll keep it quiet, <laughs> keep it on the down low, so to speak. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, do you, do you find that uh, a lot of agencies, you know, will, will bring you in, but ask you to be discreet about it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they they work very uh, privately. The information is all confidential. And, you know, once you confirm and validate information on a case that they know that there's no possible way you could know it, you know, the mood changes real quickly. So they go from maybe having half-closed ears to now their ears are, you know, 90% open to hearing what you have to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm actually working a, a local case right now. There's um, a gentleman that's been missing in my area where I live for over a year now, and his two dogs were on the scene when he was abducted. The problem is is that the dogs were left behind. So they can tell me who the perpetrators what they look like. They can tell me details about the perpetrators, how many were there, uh, descriptions of the vehicle. They can tell me those sort of things, but we're still searching for the body. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have to go to our bottom of the hour break here. So when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Karen Anderson and June Lundgren on Exploring the Bazaar. So stay tuned. back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal your hosts timothy beckley and tim swartz all right welcome back to the uh second segment of exploring the bazaar tonight we're talking with karen anderson and june lundgren we're talking about uh uh, pets, animal communication. Uh, uh, do do our uh, beloved uh, cats and dogs and horses? Uh, I mean, do they do they think? Do they have minds of their own? Do they continue on uh, after they uh, they pass away? And uh, so, uh, um, Karen, I, I suppose we'll get a little uh, you know esoteric here and uh, uh, talk about you know for. A millennia, you know, people had the conceit that uh, we were the only ones uh, who could uh, who could think or, or really even had a soul and uh, and and could exist uh, uh, onwards. Yet, uh, I know a lot of, of uh, animal communicators uh, say that uh, 
not only do uh, do our pets and, and animals uh, have minds of their own, but uh, they don't just uh, they don't just disappear when they they pass away. That they they continue on afterwards. I mean, have you uh, uh, found that to be true? Absolutely. I've written a whole book about uh, messages from the afterlife and what animals talk about. Um, as they're approaching the end of their life and uh, even sharing their insights about euthanasia and cremation and burial and what they think of what we do with their remains. And, um, no, the soul continues on. It, there's so much more out there than we've even scratched the surface on. And uh, why uh, why would animals uh, have a better inside uh, uh, track on that kind of information than than people do, or you know, people just uh, have a tendency to be just to be closed minded about things like that? Well, I don't know that they have more of an inside track, but they can share their personal experience. I know a lot of people that have pets that are listening are probably, you know, wondering how pets feel about things like euthanasia. And, and how an animal feels about the end of their life and having to make that horrible decision. And, um, you know, those are some really difficult times to go through when you have to say goodbye to a beloved pet. And there's, you know, this is like a part of the family that you're saying goodbye to. So knowing what's going on with your pet and knowing how they feel and uh, knowing if they're ready to go or if they're okay, if they still want to stay here and, and hang out with you a little bit more. Uh, those are all reasons why clients contact me and, and uh, mainly just to see if there's anything more they can do for their pets to make them more comfortable. And also, once they've passed on, uh, they want to make sure that they're okay and find out who they're with or see who greeted them when they made it to the other side. There's There's all kinds of different reasons why people would want to see how their pets are and check in with them even after they've passed on. Now, now do do uh, pets go to a different place than a human spirit would? Uh, there's, in my experience, the, the departed pets and departed human loved ones can come through together in what I call soul group or family soul group. So everybody that you're connected to for instance, your family, your loved ones, your friends, coworkers, even next door neighbors, they would be in your soul group because you're connected to them. So when I have a session and I open up the space, I basically open up a door, a window, a portal for the animals to come through and they can also bring through with them anybody in your soul group. It's usually your close family members, but we have had other people pop in too that aren't necessarily related by blood. And, um, and, and I wouldn't say that they go to a different place. Uh, they can come through together during a session, and there are very, various different levels on the other side. So there isn't just one, like, afterlife. There's various different levels and uh, for humans, too, and humans can be on different levels. So um, it, it just depends on what level that their soul has progressed how highly they vibrate as an energetic being and where they are on their journey. Uh, but they definitely do, they definitely can come back. Now, would they come back as the same animal or would they um, return as some other uh, pet? You mean, you mean as re reincarnated? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, generally speaking, and just for the sake of the show, I'll speak in general terms. Most of the time, dogs return as dogs, cats return as cats, people return as people, so on and so forth. But I have seen other cases where they have changed back and forth. Or if it's in that particular soul's highest and best um, interest to return in some other form, then I have had cases like that happen. But the majority of the time, it's usually how they were last here. You know, I've always, I've always said that I want to, I want to be reincarnated as one of my um, house cats. 
Maybe not yeah, necessarily. Yeah, a, that not. Yeah, I started saying not. You know, not necessarily just any cat, but one of the <laughs> one of the cats that we've taken care of uh, over the yeah. years because they are so spoiled and <laughs> and and hopefully so happy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you, you know, t- and they will often come back to us uh, more than one time in a lifetime. And mm-hmm. not every animal comes back. It depends on the soul's progression and and again what's in the highest and best interest for each particular pet um, but they can come back to us more than once in our lifetime and they're usually with us like the one pet like if you guys have pets at home there's always that one pet that you just love more than anything you love your other pets but there's just one you just are so closely connected to and you just can't quite describe it there's just this a sense of being somehow, you know, um, connected to on a soul level. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is, in my experience, I have found that the more times that we have reincarnated together, the longer past life history that we have with a pet, the closer we're going to feel to them in this lifetime. So we're not really playing favorites per se because we're just honoring our soul contracts from the past. We're just really we know each other better because we've been together in more incarnations than the pets that we aren't as closely connected to. But that's why. That's why there's always that one pet that's just like, oh, my God, I just love them more than anything. We're so connected. We're so bonded. Well, there's a reason for that. It's the souls remember. The soul recognition is there going back in time. You know, Tim, we were kind of ahead of the curve on this because uh, – Years ago, we, we published a book, which is still uh, available. I believe it's called A Pussy Willow, which yes. is the, uh, 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 I was going to say written, but it was telepathically communicated to our our good friend, the late uh, T. Lompson Rampa. Yeah, I think, uh, didn't Pussy Willow come out uh, originally, like in the uh, uh, 19, early, uh, middle, oh. late 1960s? Well, well, it's it, it, it it's uh it's been out there for a while now. There's a couple of books. There was um, uh, his his wife, whose name I can't remember offhand, but she also uh, communicated a uh, a book. But he had one. Uh, what was it? A Siamese cat, I think. Right. Yes. That yeah. would have been Pussy Willow that uh, uh, followed the romper around uh, and was very opinionated, <laughs> if I remember <laughs> uh, correctly. Right. I mean. Uh, Yes. Uh, I don't. I, I'm, I'm sure he loved his uh, owner, but uh, uh, he wasn't beyond uh, having a, a few uh, uh, words or two to describe perhaps uh, uh, some of uh, Rampa's uh, failings. <laughs> I think that's just uh, like uh, a lot of Siamese cats in general. <laughs> you're, you're right, right. Well, w- would you say that ca- uh, uh, animals have different uh, dispositions according to their breed? Um, that, you know, a breed comes into it, how they were raised. Um, I mean, there's so much that goes into it. Well, and that, you know, that, that also, it, it makes me think, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, animals and, and, and people and, and naturally, you know, on the physical plane, uh, we have these, you know, a delineation of, of, of species, but, um, after that, I mean, or, or maybe even before, um, consciousness is consciousness. I, you know, I, I think, and uh, I just, I, I, I wonder afterwards when when we don't have our physical bodies, uh, are we still perceiving each other by those physical characteristics? Oh, well, this is, you know, this is uncle George. He was a human. Oh, well, there's fluffy. She, she was a cat or, you know, is there a point where we get past all of that and we're just, we're just consciousness. <laughs> I think there's all different levels of consciousness. I, I know many of the pets I communicate with are a lot smarter than some of the humans I've had to deal with. <laughs> so, you know, you, you're really talking about something that is so unique and different to every individual soul. 
And um, certainly anyone who has a pet and loves a pet knows that there's uh, something there that goes beyond the spoken word, that goes beyond intelligence. It's, it's deeper than that. And, and there's, there's something very special about the human-animal bond and why our pets are with us. They're here to help us learn lessons here on Earth. They're here to teach us things, to expand our mind, to expand our consciousness. So I think there's just so much involved with it. It, it it doesn't just come down to a level of consciousness you know any living thing has some kind some level of consciousness but we're talking about our babies our pets the ones that we spend our our lives with sometimes we have pets longer than we have a spouse you know they last longer than marriages and we love them more deeply than some of our human relationships so you know that's the work that I do is is to bring together and celebrate that connection and by bringing through the animal's messages uh, it raises the connection between the person and their pet and it helps them understand each other better it gives them insight to what's going on in their life and even on the afterlife it's it's truly just getting to know them better and getting to know them on a much higher and more spiritual level yeah, I, f- I fully expect, um, you know, when when my time comes to, you know, to to leave the, you know, the 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 mortal uh, plane, that uh, not only will there be, you know, some of my relatives, hopefully, uh, 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 waiting to assist me on the other side, uh, but also probably uh, a lot of my uh, uh, favorite cats. Uh, from and and if that's the case, then there's going to be a whole room full, uh, more than a room full, oh, hallway God. full, <laughs> all the cats that I've had over the years and loved, uh, uh, waiting to uh, uh, to to take me to that great beyond. <laughs> yes, it'll it'll be kind of like that Verizon commercial where that that whole group of cats is following you around wherever you go <laughs> that's 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 me well and as as you know and as tim knows uh you know i've uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of a cat whisperer uh there's uh, uh hasn't been very often that um, I will not be able to make a fr- make friends with a cat, even even feral cats or very you know like uh, a, a aloof ho- house cats. And and I don't do anything. All I have to do is just you know go in a room and sit down, and 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 pretty soon they'll they will come to me. And uh, I suppose my next question would be the uh, the difference between um, our domestic pets and say like like wild animals uh because at one time uh, it was just you know us and wild animals i mean what any idea what that schism was that occurred that um uh, that, that then created that special relationship uh, between humans and what later would be known as uh, domestic pets domestic animals <laughs> well i think for, in my experience, that I would relate that to, you know, the dogs served us some form of protection, you know, back when mankind was bonding with them and, and mankind offered them food and shelter and, you know, they, they worked together. There was something in it for both of them, so that's probably why they were brought together. And then the relationships started to form, the bonds started to form. And look at what horses have been throughout history. You know, horses now are just recreational for the most part, but look at horses in history, what they have done for humans and how how incredible the bonds are between horse and rider going way, way back in time, you know, eons back in time. So, you know, these relationships form over need and necessity, and certainly when horses were in the workforce and had jobs and had fields to plow and, and uh carts to pull, and now, you know, we have these bonds that we form with um, the pets that we have in our lives right now. Uh, We love the relationship. We love the connection. We love having that closeness with an animal and and having that place in our heart with them that nobody else comes close to. I know personally speaking, I've had pets in my life that I've bonded with so closely that you can't even hold a candle to it in comparison to a human 
connection. There's just nothing else like it in the world. It's one of the most special and honorable connections that I've ever experienced. And I know for for me, my life has been so much fuller and so much richer because of the animals that I have had around me. And I'm sure a lot of people would agree with that. They They never betray us. They never stab us in the back. They never cheat on us. They don't steal from us. I mean, they might steal a sock or two, but you know, (laughs) the human animal, there's a lot to be said about the human animal. Who's really more intelligent here? Mm -hmm. You know, it's truly that, in my opinion, animals have an incredibly high intelligence, more so than most of the humans, especially being a police officer. You got to remember, I got to deal with all the people that nobody else wanted to deal with. And uh, truly the... um, um, the criminals of the world. So when you compare the intelligence of an animal versus that of a human, <laughs> I'm a little bit jaded as to what I have experienced. You know, Tim, when we come back from our next break, I want you to tell the audience about what you're working on now. Uh, the uh, the book about the talking animal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, we'll I, I think that will and we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll save that for uh, the, yeah. the, the the next segment of the yeah. program because uh, it is yeah, it yeah. is a fascinating program uh, uh, book. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I wanted to ask. Now, you've uh, been working. Uh, it says with a uh, uh, psychologist, Dr. Patricia Carrington, and in in what in what respect? I mean, how did how did the two of you work together? Well, she actually found me because she wanted to um, have a session with her her cat who was in his last few months of life, and she was really concerned about him. And I didn't know what she did for a living when she scheduled her appointment. And we had this incredible session, and, and the cat came through and told me all kinds of things about her and about him and their life together and his favorite memories and what he needed going forward. And she was just so blown away by that. And having been in the field of psychology for uh, the majority of her career, she wanted to combine what she had learned about human psychology and especially dealing with things such as PTSD and how pets can help us break through um, some of those barriers and challenges in our life. And so she decided that she wanted to collaborate on a book with me based on her experience that she had during the session. It was so profound. Her session moved her so much that she wanted to write a book about it. So she did. It's called The Secret Afterlife of Pets. And um, you can get all of our books on Amazon. When uh, when a person contacts you uh, and uh, is, is looking for information, what would you say... Uh, would be the most uh, 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 common uh, 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 types of information that they that they are asking from you uh, first. Uh, well, right now, I would say the biggest concerns are end of life questions, mm-hmm. pain levels, how a pet is feeling, um, if the treatment they're going through is working, if they want to stay here, if they're ready to leave their body. Those are some of the the biggest questions that I get. And then also I get the afterlife questions. Are they okay? Who are they with? Um, Who greeted them? And and just getting that validation. Most of my clients want some kind of validation, some kind of proof, quote-unquote proof, that uh, their animal is is doing well and um, still connected to them. And that's what I strive very hard to deliver during a session as I try to get very detailed information that could only be validated by that person and their pet. And and that's my goal is to get that one message. You know, it might just be one thing. It might be something really small and insignificant, like maybe what you ate for breakfast this morning or what you're doing tomorrow or a week from Friday. It'll be something very specific, but it'll be that one message that no one else in the world would know about. And that's what I strive to get from my clients. Hey, now, could you, okay, so you, uh, pets uh, tell you things about different crimes and all. Can you send a pet out? kind of as a spy? (laughs) Um, You know, I wouldn't even think to do that. I mean, why would I want a pet to be a spy? 
But well, I have well, had a words, client. If, you're, if you want to, yeah, if you want to find out something, uh, you know, find out uh, something that's going on with an individual. Yeah, maybe you can't walk into their uh, uh, house that easy, but uh, uh, the uh, the bird could be flying in the window, or the cat could be, uh, uh, you know, out on the front porch or something. Well, I have had clients contact me to find out if their spouse was cheating on them. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think about uh, it. And, and, <laughs> well, uh, they can tell me. They they can't think about. All right, think about this. This is a good one to ponder. Think about all the compromising positions that our pets have seen us in throughout their lives. Certainly, they would be able to share if there was someone new or different coming over to the house or spending time yeah. with. Or or, or an the, individual smell would be an individual smell would be different than their owners or something to that. Effect. Well, they they can tell me in much more detail than that. Yeah. They can tell me who's mm-hmm. there. They can tell me. They can, yeah. You'd be surprised and shocked at how accurate the information is that comes through. I mean, I don't I, I don't get lotto numbers. You know, that's always everybody always asks us that. Oh, if you're psychic, give us the lotto numbers. Yeah, it doesn't oh, yeah. work like that. Um, but they can tell us, you know, about your medical issues, uh, animals. Even those who have passed on will tell me what's going on right now currently with their human health situation or if they have an upcoming surgery, they'll show me that. I mean, there's so much that they know that you wouldn't even think that would be on their minds, but they're so connected to us. They love us so much that they can share all that information, and they often do. And every session is different. I never know what's going to come through. I never know who they're going to bring through with them. So that's what's fun for me because I never know what is going to be uncovered or what messages will be shared. And every session is different and unique that way. Well, all right. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're coming up uh, uh, to our top of the hour break. So uh, why don't you let our audience know uh, where they can uh, uh, find you online and uh, where they can get your books? Absolutely. Well, the easiest place to reach me is my website, which is very simply KarenAnderson.net. And there it has all the links uh, for the book and Facebook. And also my books are on Amazon, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, Hear All Creatures. You can find those on Amazon, on Audible, on Barnes & Noble, Smashwords, and just about every other retailer out there. So, um, all right. Yeah. All right. And I, I and I, I've been reading your uh, the the uh, incredible afterlife of animals and uh, uh, I love it. It's it's just a fantastic book. So uh, uh, thank you uh, for being with us uh, tonight, Karen and uh, Tim. We have to go thank to our you. top of the hour break. So uh, w- when we come back, we'll uh, uh, bring Joan London uh, uh, into the conversation on exploring the bizarre. Exploring the Bizarre. Bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, 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 ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, worlds, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. It's time to take back the night. night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right, Tim, second hour of Exploring the Bazaar. Here we are, back again. Well, you know, I, I of course, like you say, this is Exploring the Bazaar. Now, there's a, an, an item, you know, we, we broadcast uh, live from the F- KCOR uh, radio um, uh, facilities out there in Las Vegas and there was a, a, a passing of a, an individual that made the uh, news who was running for a political office and even though he is deceased I guess he passed away about a, a week or two ago he he still won the uh, local election and it's um, a fellow who had a, a reality show on uh, HBO and he is the owner or was the owner of a string of legal brothels including the alien cat house. I kid you not, mm. uh, the alien cat house, because uh, it's in the uh, 
uh, Pahrump, Nevada, which of course is very uh, uh, close to Area uh, 51, and uh, the prostitution is very legal uh, there. But uh, anyway, uh, he uh, won the election, but uh, lost his uh, life. Uh, I don't think that there's anything suspicious necessarily uh, uh, about it, although I don't believe they've uh, performed a um, uh, autopsy uh, yet. But that no. certainly is bizarre that somebody who is deceased uh, can still uh, run away with the election. Yeah, which which makes his, uh, I'm sure his opponent feels <laughs> really good about knowing that she uh, she lost to a dead man. <laughs> well, it, it it could it could happen to the. Um, I guess it could happen to the. I was going to say the best of us, but uh, uh, Dennis uh, Huff, I, I'm sure you're there in the uh, uh, in the uh, afterlife in in some little brothel in the uh, in the sky. I would uh, I would assume. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that he uh, he had one of his um, uh, houses was the alien cat house. I mean, so yeah, you can I see didn't know, I didn't know that thing. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The th- in fact, it's on the billboard. If you Google it, you'll you'll see a uh, uh, you know an illustration of a lady there, uh, an alien. You know, <laughs> on the on the poster as you come down the highway. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, anyway, uh, we've got a new book uh, coming out this uh, week that we should tell uh, uh, people about. I I haven't even got a physical uh, copy uh, yet because it's just been uh, released today and it should be going up on uh, Amazon. It's called Alien Bloodlust. Mm-hmm. Are there vampires in outer space? Now, I know that sounds strange, but uh, Tim, we are the um, uh, publishers of uh, some of the most bizarre and and strange uh, literature in the, uh, in the paranormal uh, field. Now, the main uh, content uh, here is by uh, our old-time uh, friend uh, Scott Corrales, who is a veteran researcher of all events, um, including the Chubacabra and UFO landings and abductions in uh, the Hispanic communities around the world, including Puerto Rico and Mexico and Central and South uh, America. Uh, if there's uh, something going on in the Latin-speaking uh, world, Scott is right on top of it. So he, he's the major contributor, and of course, we, uh, you and I both wrote the uh, chapters, as did uh, uh, Hercules and Sean Castile and our British uh, uh, friend over there in the UK, Nigel um, Watson. In fact, his chapter is, and I kid you not, was Dracula an alien. And mm-hmm. we have proof, pr- pretty damn good uh, proof, that uh, Vlad uh, might have been from uh, up there. And, and these aliens are coming down, and they are sucking our blood. And I'm not talking just about animal mutilations and stuff mm-hmm. like that. We're talking about real blood suckers. Uh, chupa Chupa, I, I believe, is the uh, the name that they uh, use along the uh, the Amazon, uh, where these uh, refrigerator shaped objects come down uh, either out of the sky or up out of the ocean, and uh, shoot out a beam of light at people down. Uh, from which it comes like a, a pincher type device and, and actually punctures their skin and drains them of, of some blood, not all their blood, but uh, certainly quite enough of it to be uh, noticed over 400 cases. Mm-hmm. Fabulous, fabulous, yeah. most mysterious uh, 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 ufological event uh, along the, uh, the uh, Amazon that really hasn't got as much attention as it, um, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it should be. And we hope now it will get the attention that it uh, it uh, deserves. So that's uh, Alien Bloodlust. It uh, should be up on uh, Amazon in a day or two. But uh, why, why don't you tell people about the, since it ties in with our subject uh, tonight, what you're working on currently? All right. Well, um, I am putting together, actually, uh, I'm... I'm uh, adapting a, a a book for for modern readers um about the uh, the the famous case from the Isle of Man uh, about uh, uh Jeff the talking mongoose uh, this was a case that occurred in the uh, the, the 1930s, and uh, this uh, isolated uh, farmhouse uh, with this uh, um, uh, older couple, a uh, couple by the name of uh, the Irvings, and their 
uh, their their daughter, who when the phenomena first started, she was around uh, uh, thirteen years old, and it uh, it progressed up until she was uh, past the age of eighteen. And I'm not quite sure how you would how you pronounce her name. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's the uh, the Manx uh, version of Mary it was her name, but it's like Vory, I think is how it's how how it's pronounced. Uh, but um, the their their house was invaded uh, by what they first thought was a ghost. You know, it it, it had all the earmarks, yeah, 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 earmarks of a traditional poltergeist. Uh, but then uh, it started uh, talking, and it uh, um, they caught glimpses of it, and it looked to be like a. They first thought it was like a weasel, and in fact, it it, it or its earlier names was like the uh, the 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 Manx weasel uh, talking weasel but uh, it, it later claimed that it was a, it was a mongoose that could talk mm-hmm. and this thing uh, had uh, had long conversations uh, with the inhabitants of the house it uh, uh, apparently and, it, and it, visitors it ate, and and and, tour, and tourists uh, as well some uh, some uh, visitors yeah. it uh, it, it was uh, notoriously shy. Uh, some people did hear it talk, uh, but uh, well, it was kind of uh, nasty at times too, right? Usually very few, much so, right? Four, right. Yeah, a few uh, four-letter words and. Uh, oh yeah, very yeah, very much so. The uh, uh, the original writer of the book was a, uh, a, a, a investigator by the name of Harry Price, and uh, he 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 went there a couple of times, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, Jeff uh, the mongoose always always hid uh, from him and. Uh, uh, Harry uh, uh, thought he heard it uh, once, uh, screaming at him. Uh, but some other people did uh, did hear it. So I mean, we're left wondering whether you know this was an actual uh, what the case was. You know, uh, we really don't know. Well, you know, Poltergeist. You know, was the girl a very talented uh, ventriloquist? You know, who knows? You know, it's a fascinating story. Uh, well, and, and we look forward to to bringing that up because I have looked high and low for years to find that book. And it was available, uh, you know, from rare booksellers for like eight hundred to a thousand dollars. And of course, I was going to pay that the kind of money uh, uh, for it. But uh, finally, uh, somebody uh, had a copy, and they um, made a, a file out of it uh, for us, and happily sent us to it uh, to us. And so uh, we'll be publishing the original manuscript and including our own take on it. We have other uh, animals and uh, things. Uh, uh, in supposedly inanimate objects that actually have spoken to people. Ooh, it's all very strange, but let's get on with the, uh, the show and introduce our second guest for the evening. Yeah, we have uh, 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 June uh, Lundgren, who has been uh, uh, patiently waiting <laughs> uh, uh, for uh, for her chance in the, uh, the 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 spotlight. But uh, you know, normally, you know, we'll have both guests on at the uh, same time. But since uh, Karen could only do the first hour of the show, uh, uh, we'll we'll let uh, uh, June have the uh, the entire second hour. Uh, so, June, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. It's uh, really, it's our pleasure. Now, uh, we talked quite a bit about uh, uh, you know animal communication and you know uh, you know pet psychics and, and things like that. And and, and I know that uh, um, uh, you do that as well. But uh, you know you do so much more uh, than than that. Uh, so, uh, uh, what got you started in this? I mean, you know, it's like it, it's like we asked uh, Karen at the beginning. Was this uh, uh, something uh, that uh, that you discovered that you could do as a kid? I mean, not just talk to animals, but just uh, uh, the you know, the whole psychic abilities. You know, maybe even uh, 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 seeing spirits and uh, you know people who had gone on, but for some reason are still hanging around. Yeah, my grandmother raised me, my maternal grandmother, and she was a medium. And all the women in our family, back to the 1600s, mm. they've all had abilities. And it seems to be handed down from the females in the family. And uh, uh, when my mother dumped me off on my grandmother when I was born, uh, my grandmother knew right away that I had gifts because animals would come and just you know, stare at me and sleep under my crib. And and she would see spirits and angels uh, around me all the time. So she knew that she had to, you know, start helping me understand 
from a young age what was going on and everything like that and so that we so I would learn to tell the good ones from the bad ones and uh, Michael the Archangel has always been a constant companion since I was born so you know he hangs with me a lot <laughs> we get to, we have a lot of uh, interesting conversations well now okay how how would your grandmother um, uh, teach you these things I mean you know I, I, I imagine that there you know there's not a handbook uh, available you know teach your uh, you know t- how to teach your grand uh, daughter to you know recognize the good from the bad or you know or, or, or whatever so I mean you know what what was her her process for uh, you know introducing you to this this world that you know basically was you know I mean it 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 was going to be with you no matter what well it was you know she she taught me the way her mother taught her mm-hmm. it was you know each each child that was born was taught by the mother you know, and given all the information that that person knew. And my grandmother knew that she only had like a quarter of the information that I would need. But, you know, she taught me everything she could. You know, when we would, she would run into a bad one. She would say, you know, this is how you, you know, how do you feel? You know, how you can recognize them? You know, what you should do about it. And, you know, she would, Teach, she taught me how to help people cross over and to tell the difference between an earthbound spirit, an earthbound ghost, and a spirit that's already ascended to the other side. So it was, we would have long sessions at night. And, you know, she knew that my eyes were, she said, your eyes were old soul. And so she knew that I would understand. My, you know, my intelligence, my IQ is 146. But the thing is, you know, that's got nothing to do with it because really, if you're willing to learn, and I was, then, you know, you're basically an open book. So we had many conversations. Unfortunately, my mother took me back to live with her when I was about between five and six. And and uh, uh, she didn't want to have anything to do with that, even though at one time she had gifts she basically turns her back on God. And when you do that, you know, you lose your gifts. So um, for someone, okay, now like, you know, take take your your mother, uh, for, for instance. Uh, some people, you know, like, like yourself and your grandmother and, 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 and other members of your family are, are born with these abilities if you don't work with them, um, uh, what does that what does that do for you for for your life? I mean, uh, I I have heard uh, some psychic mediums talk about how before they learned how to harness their abilities, that at times that they could almost be driven uh, insane. Uh, by what's going on around them all of the time. It can be very overwhelming. It's like, I'll give you an example where my grandmother said, okay, we were in a, we were in a shopping area and we sat down on a bench and my grandma said, well, close your eyes and tell me what you hear. And it was like being, say, in your home and it was filled with wall to wall bodies and everybody was talking at the same time Mm. and you couldn't really make out, you couldn't really make out the conversations because everybody was talking at the same time and it was, you know, they were on top of each other and what they were saying. And I told her that and she said, okay, pick a voice, pick a voice to listen to, find one that you're drawn to and listen to it. And so that's what I did. And I could focus in on that particular conversation or what that person was saying. And she, you know, after the exercise, she says, no, that's what you need to do each time because souls are all around you all the time. 
It's not like, you know, on the Ghost Whisperer or something like that, where it's like one comes through at a time. That's mm-hmm. not the way it is. They're always there, all the time. It depends upon if they want to talk to you or not. Most of them are just like like in being in New York at rush hour, going down the sidewalk, and everybody's going in the same direction. And then you've got the one person that's going opposite, going against the flow. That's the, that's the soul that wants to talk to you, the one that's going against the, the, the flow of the people. And so that's kind of how you differentiate. Uh, so um, is, uh, 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 is the earth plane, so to speak, uh, uh, filled with people who, for whatever reason, have not gone on? Uh, you know, you you talked about the uh, you know the shopping mall with everybody you know crowding around talking and you know bumping bumping it into each other. You know, is is it the same kind of situation you know uh, uh, here on Earth with uh, uh, discarnate spirits? I mean, is it uh, you know <laughs> is everything just you know full to overflowing uh, 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 with them? There are a lot of there are a lot of souls that haven't crossed over for one, one reason or the other. But when I tuned in to all those people, mm-hmm. it was on the higher vibrational plane. It wasn't. It's more like the angelic plane. Mm-hmm. I can tune in all the way up, shall we say, to from to God and the archangels. And each one of them resonates on a different frequency, a higher frequency. And if I was just to focus on the earth plane... Uh, you know, there's there's some. It's not like they're all over the place all the time. There are some that know that you can talk to them, know that you can hear them, so they'll seek you out. And so, if I happen to be going somewhere, like you know, I don't go to graveyards because it's like everybody and their brother wants to talk to me when I go to graveyards. It's not like people die, you know, people drop dead in the graveyard. That's not the fact. Fact is, they know I'm coming. So they like come from every direction to get their, you know, to get a message through or to talk to me or to help, you know, for me to help them cross over. I went to a local graveyard strictly by accident one Halloween because my sister in law wanted to go on a ghost tour and we ended up on the wrong bus. And ended up right smack at the Pioneer Graveyard. Mm. And I'm like, really? So I get out. And here comes all these people, all these souls. I'm like, oh, crap. There's about, <laughs> there's about like 30 of them, you know. And I'm like, my sister-in-law just thinks this is hysterical. I told her, I said, shut up. I said, I'm going to have these ghosts go over there and stand by you so you'll be nice and cold. <laughs> and, I, and I did. And she's like, why is it so cold? I said, I told him to stand over there. I told him, I said, okay, raise your hand, everybody that wants me to give a message to a loved one. And, you know, about 90% of them raised their hand. I said, okay, put your hands down. It's not happening. Unless you can give me a phone number and an address, it ain't Mm -hmm. happening. They're like, oh, bummer. And I said, I can help you to cross. Anybody wants to cross? I'm good. I'll, I'll help you with that. No problem. So all of them crossed but one guy, and he was still stuck in what I call his death state, where he had blood on him and everything. He died in a car accident. And I'm like, what's your issue? I said, why don't you cross? And he says, I was on my way to meet my lover. Mm. You know, he was a Catholic. And he says, you know, I can't, I can't go to heaven like that. I mean, you know, I was committing adultery. And I told him, I said, you know, move on from your death state, please. I said, you know, that's your hang up, not mine. I said, when you're ready, give me a shout and I'll help you cross. But until then, you know, you need to let go of all that baggage. Yeah, you you talked about the uh, uh, the ghost whisper earlier, and it, it reminded me of a uh, you, know, you you talked about you know being there at the cemetery with you know everybody crowding around you. It reminds me of a of, of a scene from the ghost whisper where she had gone to a hospital, but before she did, she had she put like headphones on and kept her you know her eyes to the ground. 
uh, and then it showed like uh, a perspective of what she was actually experiences. And there was, you know, she was surrounded by hundreds of, of people who had passed on, but hadn't, you know, gone, gone over yet, all trying to talk to her at, at once. There's and not that many. Go, I'm a nurse. Go, I worked in right. hospital for years. Ah, okay. There's not that many. I mean, you'll, you'll find maybe 10, five to 10 of them, you know, and then all you have to do is talk to them telepathically and tell them, you know what, you know, move on, move on. <laughs> You're dead. Get a clue. Move on. That's inter- that's interesting, you know, and, and you know, you you talk about you know the cemetery. I you know, I, I always thought that you know why would cemeteries be haunted? You know, people didn't die there. You know, their their mortal remains are there, and unless you're just you know uh, really clinging to that a cemetery, would be the last place I would think a spirit, you know, would want to go and hang out. There's a couple reasons why they hang out there. Mm-hmm. I had woman one woman come up to me. It's like, do you see this dress? Do you see it? I didn't want to be drawn. I didn't want to be buried in this dress. Look at it. It's ugly. She got kept going on and on. I'm like, eh, eh, okay, fine, fine, whatever. The other time, the guy was like, I didn't want to be buried here. I didn't want to be. I wanted to be up on the hill and look where they put me. I'm like, you know, get over it. <laughs> you know, they, usually they're not bad ones. It's just like they're complainers. You know, mm. Did you see where they put me. Mm-hmm. It's That's it's neat. it's sad to think though that you know the same kind of things that that pissed you off in life that you can carry with you uh, to the afterlife for a while at least. It's true, unless they ascend fully, you know they're still stuck in their physical world mentality, and say you know, and so they that's all they're thinking about at that. But once they can move past that and see the light and move on. It's okay, but before that, you know, some people just, that's why animals are so nice, because they cross, they don't have the baggage we have, Mm. (laughs) and it's like it's a clean break, and they're closer to God than we are. All right, I'm going to have to make a clean break here, because we are at our bottom of the hour break, so when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with June Lundgren on Exploring the the Bazaar, so stay tuned. Back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right, welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. Right now, we have with us uh, June Lundgren. And June is a uh, psychic medium, animal communicator, healer, professional nurse, demon seer, and an international author. Uh, I would think after all that stuff, uh, how would you have time to be an international uh, author as well, June? Uh, it's kind of hard. I work, you know, four to five days a week as a nurse, and I have to use my, like, lunch hour and, and my weekends and stuff to do, uh, write my books and stuff. That's about the only time I have. Okay, before we uh, uh, had to go to our uh, last uh, break, you had brought up, and we, we talked about this in the first hour of the show, about uh, you know uh, animal communication. Uh, uh, so uh, what's, what's your experience been uh, with uh, uh, talking with the animals? Uh, you know, uh, Karen gave her, her perspective. Uh, uh, what about you? I, get, I receive my information like I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. A regular conversation. Um, I've been around animals forever, and you know, first, if I talk to a one, you know, somebody calls me and says, "I need you to talk to my animal." You know, when I go to talk to them, they're at first startled that someone can actually hear them and understand them. And once they get over that, then they open up about you know where they hurt or what they need or. Or what their concerns are. I went uh, recently. I went. A gentleman asked me to come over because they had moved up from here, up from California to Oregon, and you know before they moved, everything was fine. And when they got here, the dog was just really, you know, not dealing well with the wife. It was it was like not wanting to be around her, or wanting to stay away from her, or not wanting to be close to her 
And he says, I really need you to come and talk to him and find out. Well, I get there, there's like four different dogs. And I'm like, okay, so your wife is unstable. <laughs> Her energy <laughs> is unstable. They don't like it. They don't want to be around that energy. And she's full of worry. She's full of stress. And they don't like it. And they don't want to deal with it. And I told, so I talked to the animals, all four of them, and told them what was going on and everything. And, and they settled down, and it was fine after that. Hmm. Uh, when it comes to um, the time that an animal has to pass on, you know, uh, li- like a person, uh, is it is it a similar situation where some remain behind for a while for whatever reason and then go on or you know uh, like you like you said you know earlier i mean they don't have any any kinds of baggage or or you know worried on what kind of clothes they were dressed in before they were buried uh or you know or do they just 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 go on <laughs> it depends you know mm-hmm. that some of them in fact i just had to put down what my uh, cocker spaniel about a month ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He was he was 14, and he was having these little min, <clears throat> mini seizures, and um, it end up he ended up having an aneurysm burst in his brain. Mm. So his you know his eyes wouldn't track. He was confused. He couldn't walk. All of that. And I told him I said, listen, you know, I know you don't want to be like this. There's nothing they can do to fix it. I said, you know, do you want to leave? Is it your time? You know, is that is that what you want? And he was I, good. I explained to him what was going to happen, and he was good with it. And he just went to sleep in my arms, and then that was it. Mm-hmm. I've seen, you know, I had my male Dobie. He was 12 when he died, and he's like, you know, I got up in the morning and uh, before I went to bed, I said, well, you know, it's up to you. I said, but, you know, don't stay here. If you're miserable, do not stay here. Just go, you know. And I got up in the morning. He was gone. So mm. they pretty much I've always been able to see the soul leave the body. So mm. that's, for me, that's just normal. <clears throat> Well, as uh, as as Tim Beckley asked uh, in in the first hour, uh, you you know, I mean, when when you're raised as kids, you know, you're talk you know, talk, you know, get human heaven, doggy heaven, kitty heaven, you know, things like that. I mean, it's it, 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 is is that the case, or no. is this you know the afterlife, or you know, no. there's no no you know there's no um, there's no walls <laughs> surrounding each species. There's no walls. There's no separation. Mm. He died in a motorcycle accident in 1988. So I was mm. dead for two minutes. And when I went to the other side, it's like, oh, this is cool. You know, my grandma and grandpa met me. And, and it's like, you know, it's like you become a part of a bigger whole. You can hear the thoughts of the other souls but they're like kind of like in the background you know like background noise and you can feel the connection to what some some people call the god consciousness Mm -hmm. you could feel that and there's no walls there's no time there's no distance on the other side one of the main things i learned was that time that thoughts become reality before you even finish the thought it's, you know, about going to Bermuda, you're there. Mm. That's why, you know, Michael the Archangel can be in 100 places at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because there is no space. There is no, it's not like, you know, it's kind of like walking across the floor and, you know, there you are in the same room. But it's, it is different, but there are dog, you know, there's animals there, people there, you know, angelic beings. But it's not, it's... It's a world of energy, but my brain was perceiving it because, you know, it's hard for the human brain to wrap, wrap itself around what is there. So you create, because I was still stuck in my physical mentality, it, I, you create what you think it should look like. Mm-hmm. For me, it was 
<clears throat> clouds and Michael the Archangel is there and you know and you have you're walking on a floor of a kind <clears throat> it's all clouds you know Michael says you know you need to come because you need to understand who and what you are and you have a job to do and my grandfather told me you're going to have a son in the next year and so I just met my husband at that time and about a year later my son was born Hmm. I'm surprised your son, you didn't meet your son there and say, Hey, go back. He was, he was <laughs> yeah, one of, I, I need my chance. He was one of my guardians. Mm, mm-hmm. I get, I get the impression, um, from hearing descriptions from people who have had near death experiences that, um, at least for a while, um, your, your, your perception of the afterlife is, is based a lot on your conceptions of, of what you were, uh, of what you were going to expect uh, while you were living. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're a Catholic, you know, you would, you would go to, you know, you would, you would experience like a Catholic heaven and, exactly. uh, and, and, you know, if, if you were a bad person and knew you that you were a bad person for a while, you would end up, you know, in, uh, in, in, you know, like the land of shadows, so to speak, uh, yeah. which I think is, go, go ahead, go ahead. Are, I'm sorry. You are stuck in your, you know, your physical world mentality because mm-hmm. people that are, have the, you know, near death experience or whatever they want to call it. It's because you're stuck in there because you're going back. If you had died, if you died and you n- were not going back, then you'd leave all that behind. Mm-hmm. But because you are meant to go back, you still maintain that physical world mentality. Well, and plus, uh, there's there's probably, uh, and you you talked about this before, you know, like uh, different vibrational levels. When you first ascend, you're going to be, you know, like a a new spirit, so to speak, unless you go for that red light and find yourself reincarnated again. Uh, you know, after you know you've been deceased for a while you your you know your vibrational frequency you know shifts and you go yeah. higher or whatever you'd want to call it <laughs> yeah. it's all about free will we don't we aren't made to come back and most people souls do not want to come back right away Be, you know what we there's no concept of time over there i'll give you an example my husband died on the arizona in 1941 and he was reborn in 1945 so he was reborn quickly. And when he was reborn, he had an absolute fear of drowning without mm. ever having the experience. And so some of that, when it's traumatic like that, holds over into the next lifetime. And so, you know, he says his mother said, never had a slip in the bathtub, nothing. But he's always had that absolute fear. Mm. And then one day, one night, he said, you know, he, Woke up the next morning, he says, listen, I've had this dream for the last, um, I've had this dream for the last three nights in a row, and it's always the same. He says, I'm on the Arizona, I'm walking through water like you walk through air. Mm -hmm. And the big topic of conversation is, why didn't they come for us? He said, next thing I know, I'm on the monument, and I'm running my finger down to find my name. He says, I find it, and I wake up. He said, can you get me a list of the men that died on the Arizona? And I'm like, okay. 18 pages later, he comes, he he says, this is it. This is who I was. This is a man, if you can't touch it, feel it, or see it, it doesn't exist. He's an auditor, so he's very left-brained. Mm-hmm. He says, this is who I was. I named, uh, you know, the name that he found was Raymond Arthur Roby. I named my son after my grandfather, Ray Arthur Palmer. Huh. No such thing as coincidence. No, no, not at all. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, when it, when it comes to reincarnation, I've often wondered, uh, because, you know, like, like yourself, uh, it's often talked about how, you know, the, uh, uh, the level, 
out of the material plane is timeless. And uh, when we refer to reincarnation, we, you know, we talk about past lives and that sort of thing. But if the uh, uh, afterworld is timeless, are we actually experiencing our other lives right now at this very moment? You know, there's, it's not, it's not a past life. It's, it's a current life as well. At the same time as we're living here, you know, in the 21st century, our souls are also living in, you know, the 19th century, 18, you know, what, whatever. And, you know, into the future as well, all of it existing simultaneously. You know, I, I asked that question too, because I thought, you know, much the same thing, but they're like, no, said you can look at the past and see, you know, what you did in the past, how you lived, you know, who you were, but you cannot live in the past. Mm. You must progress. You know, that Michael says you must progress. You cannot stay locked in the past. He says everything moves forward. Even over here, he says everything moves forward. So this is my 131st life. So, mm. so, but the thing is, you know, you learn once you cross. Everything is purged from that lifetime, except for the experiences that you wish to have. It's kind of you have to figure. Okay, there are certain things that are set in stone: the time we come in, the time we leave, the method in which we leave. And what we want to accomplish during that time. Say we want to be born on, you know, November 27th. We want to be a doctor. And we want to die, you know, on the 18th of April, you know, 40 years later. So all of this happens. And I want to get hit by a car and that's how I'm going to die. Oh, yay. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, we think, oh, my God, you know, that's going to hurt. But on the other side, it doesn't equate that way it's like no never experienced that i would like to experience that it's all about the experience mm -hmm. you know my son says i bet you know the secret of life and i said yeah i said it's all about the experience they want to come back and relive lives uh, doing things they've never done before maybe dying of cancer maybe just dying of old age and maybe having a child maybe you know being an opera singer or whatever well, that brings that brings to mind. Then um, is the future already determined? Uh, you know, are we are we living in a block universe where the future it's already set? Certain things are set, like with each individual, and certain things that are going to happen are known to happen that are coming in the future. Mm -hmm. But personal things you know like there it's free will mm -hmm. instead of turning left you turn right instead instead of going to the store you stay at home now that we do have that ability to change certain aspects but like i said the things that are set in stone you can't change mm -hmm. time you come in time you leave the method in which you leave even you know what you want to accomplish can be changed if you change your mind during it but you know that's just that's just the way it is. We are not living in, you know, certain things are fixed. Uh, in my book, A Medium's Guide to the Paranormal, I was sick one day and my husband went to the store to get me some juice and I had a high fever and God says, "This, I'm going to give you some information about what's coming mm -hmm. and I want you to write it down. So I just basically started um, you know, automatic writing. Mm -hmm. Information just came. And there's a, a chapter in my book about it. it. talks about the things that are coming. And one of the things have al has already come to pass. So. Hmm. Well, I'll have to look for that book. Because <laughs> right now here in the United States, it, just, it seems to me that things uh, aren't very pleasant. And uh, the future isn't looking very pleasant. But, you know, hopefully it's just, just a phase, so to speak. As they say. <laughs> This too shall pass. <laughs> uh, you talked about uh, um, um, uh, the 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 archangels, you know, Michael and uh, and, and the others. Uh, what exactly is an archangel? An archangel is someone who has progressed to the highest level 
outside of, you know, the God consciousness. Mm -hmm. And they have lived for hundreds of thousands of years. And they have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience. There are certain ones that are basically the elite ones. And that's Michael and Gabriel, Raphael, Ezekiel, and Ariel. And these ones are what they call avenging angels. They were also demon slayers. And when I died in my motorcycle accident, Michael said, you know, this this is who you are. You are Ariel, the archangel. You were sent back to relive mortal lives until you learned to have compassion for mankind. Because you had no compassion. You'd been here so long, you forgot how to care about people. Because I guess in the 1700s, she was removing a demon from a living woman and the woman died and god said you know what this isn't the first time this happened you don't care that the body died you don't care that the person died so you need to go back and relive mortal life so that's why it's so easy for me to remove demons within a matter of minutes because of what what's inside of me and people say that when she comes forward I'm able to pull her forward, then my face changes, my eyes go white, and my face changes, and my voice changes. But I don't, you know, I don't see that because I'm busy removing things. Mm -hmm. But, and, you know, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is helping the people. You know, if I can remove the demons and them back where they need to go and help the families, then that's what I do. All right. Well, we asked about the archangels. What about uh, what about demons? What are demons? Demons. Uh, demons are. You have to understand where they came from. They they were white angels at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, you know, you talk. People talk about the war between heaven and hell. What happened was, when we had more. When we had physical bodies before, you know, so long ago, and in a different galaxy, we were. You know, had physical bodies, but we all evolved as after time. We all evolved, and we traveled the known universes and everything around. See, did everything, observed everything, and then it came to a point where some of them said, "You know, we really want to have children again. We want to experience physical love. Uh, you know, a physical life. We're tired of traveling and and not ha really not having a life of our own." And then there arose a division between, you know, the souls. It, one side said, no way. We don't want to be subject to growing old, having pain, dying, none of that stuff. Cancer, disease, we don't want it. So that's what caused the war. And when Michael disarmed Lucifer and Ariel disarmed his son, you know, God told him, you know, you're going to give you exactly what you want. You're never going to be able to have physical form again and but you will live in darkness hmm. and they were good with that at first they were like we don't care we don't even want to you know be doing that stuff but over the centuries they get a little upset and pissy and started obsessing about well you know if the white light souls are coming and living physical body in physical bodies they have they're weak so that's where we're going to attack them we're going to make their life a living hell and so that's what they try to do. So is is there is there no hope for them? Because I mean, you know, hearing that 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 makes me kind of sad. You know, to think yes. that they're they, you know that here's these souls that you know are possibly forever in darkness. You know, doing bad things. No, because Azrael had Azrael was an archangel, and still is. He volunteered him and twelve others volunteered to go to the entrance of the darkness and stay there and be vigilant for those who wish to come back to the light. And if they want to come back to the light, you know, they'll go before God and he'll make the judgment. And if he finds that they're, that they're worthy of coming back to the light, then he'll let them come back. They're not stuck there forever, but they have to mean it and they have to you know, believe that they need that they are changing. You know that they want to make a change, and he'll take them before God. And so, there's always somebody there for him. 
All right, June. Well, um, we only have about two minutes left in tonight's program. Time always flies. Uh, why don't you let our audience know uh, uh, where they can find out more about you and uh, where they can uh, find your books? Um, you can find my books on Amazon.com. Uh, if you look up June Lundgren, you'll you'll find all eight of them. And uh, my website is mysticconnections.org. Or you can also type in demonseer.com and it'll bring you to the same one. And you can contact me there. And you can also, you know, schedule a reading or animal communication. Or, you know, if you need help with a negative entity or something like that, you can contact me as well. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, uh, I guess that uh, just uh, uh, just recently you were on uh, uh, Ghost Adventures that uh, aired in the middle of October. Uh, what was those episodes called? It was called, It was a four four part special called Graveyards of the Pacific. Mine was the gra- Graveyards of the Pacific. It was the Norblad Hostel, and I was I was with the Ghost Adventures crew on that. All right. Well, and I know that uh, those will be uh, repeated uh, ad infinitum, so <laughs> we'll have to uh, watch for that. All right. Well, we're going to have to uh, wrap up the program. So uh, thank you, June. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Tim, Tina, Peter, and everyone else. Uh, you've been listening uh, to it. Ex- yes, indeed. Yeah, Tim, you're still there. So uh, we're going to have to. Well, I, haven't, I haven't moved a muscle. All right. Well, we're going to have to move now because the show is over. So good night, everyone. Taking my dog for a walk. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting nonstop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained with you as their co pilot Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaars.